Hello everyone, we are back in the second module of our Eco 590 Math Camp for Economics at Stony Brook University. What I want to do in this sub-module is to discuss with you some of the properties of functions that we typically use in economics. Now, this is going to come handy when you are solving problems or specifying, for example, an environment, because what you will typically have is either an objective function or a budget set, and these are going to fall into either a linear function, a quadratic function, a polynomial, a logarithmic function, etc. We use those a lot in economics. So if you don't remember some of the more important properties, this is going to be a useful submodel to go through. You can look at the slides, you know, it's relatively easy. So if you can see them, there's no need to go through the whole explanation in the video. Now, the first thing we are going to talk about is linear functions. So linear functions are denoted by equations in which, again, remember, a function is a rule that relates an independent variable x to a dependent variable y, and the formula for a linear uh, equation looks like the one that we have here, where a represents the slope. This is just going to be a number, as in the examples before, below, sorry. So, for example, in the first example, a is equal to 2. In the second example, a is equal to 1. And in the third example, a is equal to minus 9. And there's going to be another number that is typically going to be known, which is the intercept. The intercept is just the value of our function when the independent variable is equal to 0. So, in the first example, b is 5. In the second example is minus 13, and in the third example is minus 1. The graph of an equation or a linear function is typically a straight line. So I have here a graphical representation. As I said before, b is going to represent a, what's called the y-intercept, and we typically find it by setting, so we find b by setting x equal to 0, and it's going to be the point at which our line intersects the, y, the vertical axis. To draw a, a, a straight line, you only need two points in the Cartesian um, space. You need the y-intercept and the x-intercept. The x-intercept is simply the value of our equation when y is equal to zero. So in this example, when y is equal to zero, ax plus b is equal to zero, so the value of x when y is equal to 0 is simply minus b over a. And this is the value that we have here. So a straight line, if you know the equation of the line, can be drawn by just knowing these two numbers, putting them in the y and x axis, and then joining them by a straight line. Now, a, it's known as the slope, and it's basically telling us the change in the dependent variable when the independent variable increases by one unit. So when, x, when the independent variable is x, we know that this is the value of the dependent variable. When the independent variable is equal to x plus 1, this is the value of y. So what is the change in y? Is the difference between the second line and the first. So it's ax plus 1 plus b minus ax plus b, and this is after, you know, you, you simplify this equation, this is simply a. So it's telling us by how much y changes, in this case increases because an increasing function, when x rises by one unit. Now the typical, typical case in which we are going to have a straight line is, for example, when we talk about a budget constraint. So in a budget constraint, we have income being a function of our x variable is typically the number of hours worked. What is our a? a is going to be the wage, and b is going to be, say, the level of savings. So the amount of money that you're going to have at each point in time is going to be whatever you have in the bank, s, plus the number of hours that you work times how much money you can make per hour work. So W, in this case the slope, is going to indicate how much more money can you make for every extra hour that you work. We are going to talk a little bit uh, in the third sub-module of this section about derivatives. Basically, A is the derivative of this function, for those of you that, 
you know, remember or should remember what a derivative is. Now, you do, do if, if you, if sometimes you do not have the equation of a function, but you know two values that the functions can take, two x's and two y's, and you can easily compute the formula uh, for, for the, the slope, just knowing these two coordinates in the x, y space. How do you do that? Well, remember what I said before, a is just the change in the dependent variable when you increase the independent variable. In a straight line, it doesn't need to be by one unit. It could be by as many units as you want, because actually the slope of a straight line is always constant. So all you need to know is, you know, by how much does y change when you increase x. If you grew up in the US, this is basically the ratio between the rise and the run. The rise is the difference between the y's, y2 minus y1. The run is the difference between the x's, x2 minus x1. Okay, once you know the slope, you can back out the intercept because all you will need to do is to know, okay, given the slope and given that you know x1 and y1, you can just compute what b must be in order for the equation to hold. So let's do it with a very simple example. We know two points in the space. So x is equal to 3, y is equal to 9. This is one point that we know the line goes through. The other point is x is equal to 2, y is equal to c. This is another point that in, for which our straight line might, must pass through. And what we are trying to figure out is what is the equation of the line? What is, what are, what is the a and what is the b? So these are the unknowns that we are trying to back out from knowing these two numbers. So the slope formula, we just look at by how much does y change, 9 minus 3 is 3, so we put 3 in the numerator, over by how much the x changes, 3 minus 2 is 1, so we put 1 in the denominator. So we know that this, is a, this must be a, a straight line with a slope of 3. So we already know what our a is, now let's figure out what b is. Well, we know that when x is equal to 2, and we've already figured out that the slope is equal to 3, we know that this function must be equal to 6. So what is the value of b? Well, the only value of b that will make this function whole is equal to 0. So we know that this is a function that passes through the origin, so when x is equal to 0, y is equal to 0, and has a slope of 3. There are many situations in which, you know, you will have this partial information and you need to recover the equation of, uh, of a straight line, and this is just a simple way of doing it. Now, as I said before, um, the graph of a linear function is a straight line. The example we were looking at is an increasing uh, straight line. Your, your graph can, can be decreasing. This will happen when a is negative. So the function is going to be decreasing. Um, it could be flat. This is an ex so this is an example where a is equal to zero. We looked at this example in the first module. a is equal to zero. The intercept is equal to four. This is basically a function where y is always equal to four regardless of the x. A vertical line is a, is a line in which the slope is not well defined because basically, you know, it, 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 it's yeah, it's a function that we're, we are not going to have slope. But um, but again, when you have a straight line, depending on the value on a, it's going it can be something increasing, decreasing, or flat. These are the typical functions that you are going to find. Now, the second set of functions that we are typically interested in are quadratic functions. Quadratic functions are going to have this form here, a times x squared plus b times x plus c. So a, b, and c are typically known numbers or parameters. These are typically going to be specified and you are going to know what they are, and x is our independent variable, and f of x or y, again, is our dependent variable, okay? So
So sometimes, uh, 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 in, in, sometimes we refer to a quadratic function as a parabola, uh, and this is a function that it's going to appear typically either when you talk about adjustment cost in the in the when you're talking about production. Um, sometimes profits are going to have a quadratic form, so it's one that is going to come frequently uh, in in your classes. Now, a, a quadratic function is always going to be either strictly concave or strictly convex. When a is positive, your, the parabola is going to be a convex function, like the one in the first plot. When a is negative, the parabola is going to have a concave shape. It's going to be concave down, like in the second plot. And then uh, there's a, a, another set of characteristics that we are sometimes interested in, which are the points at which the points or the value of x is at which the value of y is zero, uh, and these are called the roots of the parabola. And these are in, we are interested in because if you are talking, say, about profits, like in the second case, sometimes you are going to be interested in what are the break-even points for a firm, and those are going to be given by points R1 and R2. Now, a parabola will typically <coughs> be either have no roots, like in this case, it, it's never intersecting the y-axis. It's going to have one root, which is when either it's the, the, the parabola is touching or is tangent to the, uh, it, to the vert, uh, horizontal line at the maximum or at the minimum, or it's going to have two roots. So again, a parabola can only have either one, zero, or two roots. These are going to be all the options. So how do you find these roots? Well, again, remember, what is a root? By definition, a root is the value of x such that y is equal to zero. And there are two ways in which we typically do this. Sometimes the equation is easy enough that you can factor it in. So let me give you an example, x squared minus one, so let's think about this function. So this one can be factored easily as x plus 1 times x minus 1. You know, if you use the distributive law, you're going to see that the, these two formulations are equivalent. So clearly, if we want to make this thing equal to 0, then either x has to be equal to 1 or x has to be equal to minus 1. So sometimes the function is easy enough that you can kind of figure out exactly what the roots are going to be. Sometimes, like in the second example, you know, it's a bit more complicated to know how to factor it in, but we have the following formula. Uh, so all you need to identify is what is the a, b, and c, and then just apply the formula. So in this example, a is equal to 8. Remember, a is what's multiplying the square of the parabola b is what's multiplying the, the linear part, it's equal to minus 2, and c is basically the value of the function um, when x is equal to 0, and this is just minus 6. So we can apply this formula, what are these roots going to be? So minus b is minus minus 2, which is just 2, plus or minus, so when it's plus it's going to be one of the roots, when it's minus it's going to be the other root, b squared minus 2 squared minus 4 times a, which is 8, times c, which is minus 6. The square root of all this thing divided by 2 times a, which is equal to 8. So, you know, if you um, work through this, if you calculate this, this is going to be 2 plus minus 14 over 16. And basically, this means that either the root is going to be minus 3 fourths or it's going to be equal to 1. Okay, so this is going, to, we are going to see an example in a bit where we are actually have to calculate one of the roots. So let, let's go through an application to connect a little bit this mathematical concept to a standard, you know, intermediate micro problem that you are going to see. Of course, the problems that you are going to see in your first and second year are a bit more complicated, but I'm just trying to use things that you probably saw in your intermediate classes to make 
to make you remember uh, in, a, in a bit of an easier way. So one thing I want to say at this point is, let me read the application and then we are actually going to solve the problem. One thing that is going to be very important and is going to be particularly challenging if English is not your first language is to go from a setup that is in words to a mathematical representation. Not because you don't know the math, but because sometimes it takes a long time to know the English. So at least when I came and when I did my PhD, this was one of my biggest problems when I was sitting at exams, because I would first, you know, read the setup, try to think it back in Spanish, with, which is my mother tongue, solve it, go back, write it in math, and then, you know, try to spell out a, 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 an answer in English. That took me a long time, and that made me very, very, very slow in exams, and that hurt my performance. So one thing that I would suggest you to work on if, you know, your English is a bit rusty or not super, you are not super quick at it, is to practice a lot going from word problems into mathematical problems. Because in my experience, this is one of the big disadvantages that foreign students are going to have. So I'm going to do this first example. We are going to write the equations. There's examples like this in the homework. There's also more examples like this in Simon and Bloom, and you probably could find them in any intermediate microbook like Berrian or, or something like that. So let's go to the example. Consider a firm that is producing good X and sell it at price P. It faces a demand function or an inverse demand function P is equal to 9 minus X, and the cost per unit produced is $5. So, few things. So, this is going to be your demand. You already have the equation. Now, what does cost per unit produced mean? It means that if you produce 5, you're spending... Sorry, if you produce 1 unit, you spend $5. If you produce 2 units, you spend $10. So, this thing here is also sometimes known as the variable cost. And it depends on how many units you produce. Finally, the fixed costs are going to be $3. So fixed costs are costs that do not depend on the amount that you produce. So you, when as long as you produce a positive amount, you have to pay them. Now, what is what do we need to do here? We need to find the break-even values. So first, we need to know what are break-even values. Break-even values are the values of production such that profits are equal to zero. So what that, So the first thing we need to think about is what is our ultimate objective. Our ultimate objective is figure out how much do we need to produce not to lose money. Now, that means that we need to write down what profits are. So let's go back to our intermediate micro. Profits are the difference, are going to be a function of how much I produce, which is X, and are going to be a difference between revenues, which depend on production, and costs, which also depend on production. So what are our revenues? Well, we are going to make, which we can just call this R of X if you want. This is going to be P times X, the amount that we produce times the amount of money that we make for each unit produced. And this is just going to be nine minus X, times x, or 9x minus x squared. So here we already have a quadratic function. Let's call this R of x. Our costs, which are also going to be a function of production, are going to be our variable cost, which is $5 times the number of units that we produce, plus our fixed cost. Notice that our cost function is a linear function, our revenue function is a quadratic function. And again, I'm not multiplying 3 times 6 because it's a fixed cost. It doesn't depend on whether you produce 1, 2, or 100 units. You're always going to be basically uh, spending the same amount. So what is our profit, P of X, is the difference between revenues and costs and this is just going to be 9x minus x squared minus the cost function, which is 5x plus 3. This is just, let me write it in, in a form that is similar to the one we saw before, minus x squared. Then you have plus 9x 
minus 5x minus 3. Okay, so here I'm using some of the properties we talked about last time. I'm using the distributive law, the fact that when you multiply, you know, minus times a number, minus times plus is a minus, etc. And this is just minus x squared plus 4x minus 3. So this is our profit. Now, we are not trying to max it, and, and, and what you have here, it's a graphical representation of our P of x. Now, what are they asking us to do? Are they asking us to find the maximum profit? No, they are asking us to find the break-even values. So what we need to find is the values of profits if this is the amount of production. And this is profits. We are trying to figure out the value of production that would make our profit zero. So let's go back to what we were discussing before. Basically, we are being asked to figure out the roots of this function. Now, we already have the function written in this form, so we can simply use the formula here, okay? So what is the a in this example? The a is minus 1, the b is 4, and the c is minus 3, okay? So if we apply the formula, we are going to have minus 4 minus b plus minus b squared, 16, minus 4 times a, which is minus 1, times c, which is minus 3. Oh, sorry, this looks ugly. Divided 2 times a minus 2 times, um, 2 times minus 1 which is going to be minus 2. So, you know, you just do the calculation and you're going to find that either we need to produce one unit or we need to produce three units. So if you produce more than three units, we are going to lose money. If you produce less than one unit, we are going to lose money. We are going to break even when we produce one and three. And if we produce anything in between one and three, we are going to be making money in this example. Okay, now let me move to another uh, set of functions that we are typically going to use. Both linear and quadratic functions are special cases of this one, which are called polynomial functions. So polynomial functions are sums of, you know, a numbers, so remember these are our parameters of our pol polynomial, and these are the exponents of our polynomial. So for example, a cubic function is going to be a polynomial function, like this one, 3x cubed minus 1, or this other cubic function is going to be a polynomial. And typically, we call n the order of the polynomial. So a cubic function is a polynomial of order 3, you know, a, a, a quadratic function is a polynomial of order 2, a linear function is a polynomial of order 1. Um, we are typically, these functions may appear, they are going to appear a lot when you are trying to do approximations. So sometimes you are going to have an economy and you're going to have a function and you will want to figure out, you know, what is the best mathematical representation for something that comes out of a simulation or a vector and you will typically use a polynomial to try to find an approximation. We will talk about this a little bit in this class, but probably when you are in your, in your computational classes. This is an example where they typically show up. Now, rational functions are just the ratio of two polynomials. So this guy is a polynomial function. This is another polynomial function. So we are just dividing two polynomials. Now, one thing that is going to be important when you think about uh, rational functions is how to specify the domain, because the domain has to exclude values of x such that the denominator is, is zero, because when the denominator is zero, the function is not going to be well defined. So there's going to be examples, you are going to see some of them in the homework, in which you will have to be a bit careful specifying what the domain is going to be. So let's, let's look at a typical example, 1 over s, so, sorry, 1 over x. This is a, a, an example of a polynomial. In the numerator, you have a polynomial of order 0, 
which is x to the zero, which is one. In the numerator, you have polynomial of order one, x. So the ratio between the two is one over x. How does one over x looks like? It looks like this, uh, this is the graph of one over x. It's a function that, as you can see, it's only, um, it's not going to be well defined at zero because one over zero is not defined, but it's going to be defined for other numbers. In this case, you know, we are defining it for, for all the positive numbers. So this is going to be our domain. One, it, it could have also some negative numbers, but the one that it cannot have is uh, zero because then it's not going to be well defined. Now, we talked a little bit about these functions um, in the first module. These are also going to be very useful functions, uh, the exponential function. Here, notice a polynomial has x to the a, so where x is the independent and a is just the number, an exponential function has a to the x. Again, a is the number, x is the independent variable. So these functions are typically used when, when you talk about utility functions, especially with constant absolute risk aversion. They, these ones are used a lot in finance, and that's why I'm kind of showing them to you here. This is where they are typically used. They are also used a lot in econometrics. You know, when you talk about the normal functions, that's a, a, a type of, of uh, an exponential function. And other uh, probability distributions are typically exponential functions. Now, a in this case is the base of this function, and uh, typically, uh, you know, a and b are positive, uh, and a is not equal to one because one to any number x is just simply equal to one. So here I have two examples: two to the x. Um, and 0 0.5 to the x. You know, this is how these functions are going to look like. Now, um, a, a very another function that you are going to use a lot, and we like it a lot for, for utility functions because it typically allows us to have closed form solutions when we are solving maximization problems, is the logarithmic function. The log logarithmic function is just the inverse of the exponential function. This is how it is defined. So remember, inverse of a function f is a function g such that when you evaluate g at f of x, you get back x. So the definition of, logar of a logarithmic function with base a is just a function uh, that is the inverse of our exponential function. Okay, so when, so here you have kind of the definition. Now, logarithmic functions can take any base, any positive base, and here I have some examples. Uh, you are going to have to do some of these examples in the homework. You can take a look at them um, in the book as well. Now, here is the plot of the logarithmic function. As you can see, for example, here, the, the green line is the log of x with base a, the blue line is the exponential function. They are mirror images of each other. Now, one thing that is uh, typically going to happen is that the log, and this is for a greater than one, this is the example for a greater than one, the log of one is always going to be zero, and the inverse, which is um, a, to the zero is going to be equal to one. So this function, the log function crosses the, the, the x axis at one and the exponential function crosses the y axis um, also. You know, when, when x is equal to zero, y is equal to one, okay? When the value of a is between zero and one, the exponential function is going to look like this blue line and the logarithmic function is going to look like this green line. Now, this one is our typical, typical um, utility function. And, you know, you're going to use it a lot, so remember a little bit how it looks like. Why is our typical utility function? Because look at it. 
it's a function that is increasing, it's concave. These are properties that we like in the utility function because the marginal rate of so, sorry, the marginal utility is positive but is decreasing. It has an asymptote at zero, meaning that you would never want to have negative consumption. So this is a function that we like a lot uh, in economics, and you're going to see it over and over again. Now, there is one that is even more used in economics, which is a natural logarithm, and it's defined as the inverse of the x function. So the x function is the value, uh, is this one. It's, it's so common, it has its own names x function, where E is defined as follows, definition of E is the limit as n goes to infinity of this expression at the top. If you compute that limit, you get a number that is 2.71, etc., etc., etc. Now, the inverse of the exponential function is the natural logarithm. And it's a, a specific logarithmic function. It's a logarithmic function. This one is a logarithmic function with base e. Notice that e is bigger than 1, so it's going to have this shape here. Uh, so we define, again, the natural logarithm of x as the inverse of the exponential function. These two are going to be as I used a lot, as I said before, the exponential function, we like it a lot in finance. The logarithmic function is something we typically like a lot in macroeconomics or, or microeconomics. Now, there are some rules for logarithms and, and, and exponential functions. Uh, these ones we kind of talked about before. If you have a to the r, times a to the s, this is a to the r plus s. If you have the ratio between two, uh, a to the r and a to the s, it's a to the r minus s. And if you take a to the r and multiply and multiply to the exponent of s, then you have a to the r times x. We talked about this. You did some examples of this in the first module. Now, for logarithms, these are properties that you actually want to um, remember because you are going to use them basically every day in your classes. As I said before, regardless of the base, this could be for the natural logarithm or for any base A greater or smaller than one, the logarithm is of one is always zero. So when you, pl pl when you plot a logarithmic function, um, the logarithmic function is going to cross always the x-axis um, at the value of 1. So y is going to be 0 when x is equal to 1. Or the function is going to be 0 when... Then the logarithm of a number... The, the logarithm with base a of a is always going to be equal to 1. This is, again, almost by definition, by the fact that 1 is the inverse of each other. Another property that is going to be useful is that for any logarithm, if you are multiplying two numbers r times s, this is going to be, uh, so the logarithm of the product is the sum of the logarithms of the two numbers. This is typically go going to be used when you are thinking about, for example, you have savings, s, and r is the interest rate. You know, you can uh, write it like the log of the product if if you're thinking about a utility function and this is the level of consumption at some point in time, or you can write it as the sum of the two parts. Sometimes writing it in this way is a little bit easier because when you do optimization, it makes the algebra a little bit simpler. So this is something that you know, you're know you going to want to keep in mind. The logarithm of the ratio uh, between R and S is the difference between the logarithms of r and s and the logarithm of r to the power of s is s times the logarithm of r. This one basically follows from this one because the log the log of base a of r to the s is simply the log of r times r times r s times which is obviously s times the logarithm of r, okay, at base a. And again, this works 
for any base, in particular for the natural logarithm. Now, one thing that uh, I want to, the, the, the second thing I want to mention in this module is that when you are setting up your problem, uh, and as in the case that we looked at the application that we look at for break-even values, many times you will have to do algebra, not with numbers, but with functions themselves. Uh, so let's go back to the example I was talking about before. Consider a firm that is selling X unit of a commodity and receives a, a revenue R times X, R of X. This was, you know, the price 9 minus X times X in our example. Um, and it has a cost of producing that X, which is C of X. Let's say that the two functions are linear. So we represent the revenue as an increasing function R the cost as an increase in function R, uh, C, the profit is just the difference between revenues and cost. We did that in the application. By looking at the graph of, the, of this function, we can derive some properties of P and R. Notice that the profit function is simply the difference between two other functions. It's the difference between R and X. How do we think about the difference between the two functions? Well, we just subtract the values of the function at each value of x. So we can see that if when we look at profits, there's going to be a break-even point, a point at what profits are zero. To the left of that, costs are going to be bigger than revenues. So here you are going to lose money. To the right of the break-even point, revenues are going to be bigger than cost. So you are going to make money or profits are going to be positive in this range, profits are going to be negative. So you can learn a lot about our, your object of interest by thinking about the underlying functions that you're using to construct your profit function. Now, in general, for any type of function, you can do any of the standard operations you would do with numbers, you can do them with functions. So functions can be added, subtracted, multiplied, divided, pretty much like numbers. The, and again, you're going to do this pointwise. So if you have uh, sorry, f, the function f and the function g, and you add them up, basically what you're doing is you're adding, uh, adding them up x by x. Now, the only thing that you're going to be careful when you do operations, particularly when you divide functions one by the other, is that you need to make sure that the domain is well defined. So the, the, the values in the domain of the new function have to be in both the original functions, and we need to make sure that we are never dividing by zero. So sometimes the domain of a function that is, you know, added or subtracted from another one is going to be different than the domain of the original function, because we need to make sure that the new function is well defined. So let's look at a few examples. So you can add two functions, f and, and, and g, and you're going to do that by just adding number by number. So in example one, f of x plus g of x is just going to be x minus one. So notice the blue, the sorry, the red line here is our g function. The blue line here is our f function. It's a function that note it passes through zero. Our new function, f plus g, is going to be the black function. We take a straight line with a slope of one and we subtract the number one. So it's as if we are moving the function a little bit to the right. We can do this with a quadratic function. So f of x plus g of x is x squared plus two plus x minus one. This is just going to be x squared plus x plus one. So again, our g function is this one. Our x function is the blue, is the blue one. And our black function is the sum of the two functions there. Now you can subtract function. Oh, and let me say another thing. In both these cases, the domain is basically any real number. You know, there's no restriction you need to impose here. You can subtract two functions. So what is f of x minus g of x? This is just going to be x minus minus 1, which is x plus 1. Again, the red is G, the blue is F, and this is F plus G. So now 
we are moving our function to the left. So, you know, you can look at it if, if at zero, uh, you subtract minus one, you get plus one. So the new function passes, uh, has an intercept at one. And you can do the same thing for our second example, minus x minus one. This is f plus g at x. So this is x squared plus two minus x plus one. And this is x squared minus x plus three. Okay. And again, this is our g, etc. Now you can multiply functions. So here you need to remember some of the, uh, the typical properties of algebra, because remember, we are doing it point by point. So you are doing it for every point in the domain. So what is f times g of x is just the product between the two functions. So it's x times minus one, which is minus x. So if this is our g function and this is our f function and we multiply them, we obtain a function that has a negative slope of minus one, which is the black line. Um, what do we get in the second example? f times g of x is x squared plus two times x minus one. So this is, you know, we use the distributive law, s x squared times x, which we can directly write as x cubed plus x squared times minus one. This is minus x squared plus two times x plus two times minus one. So this is just x cubed minus x squared plus 2x minus 2. Okay, and this is our g, this is our f, and this is the product of the two. So when we multiply them, we went, we multiply a linear and a quadratic function, we obtain a cubic function, which is plotted by the black line. Now again, the domain in these two is simply the real, there's no restriction that you need to impose. Finally, you can divide two functions, and here is when you have to be a bit careful. So what is f over g of x? It's just f of x, which is x, over g of x, which is minus 1. So this is minus x. Um, so the, and, you know, it's illustrated here by the black line. In, and again, here, we are fine. The domain is going to be any real number. In the second example, on the other hand, when you do f over g of x, we have x squared plus 2 over x minus 1. So again, this is our g. This is our f. Now, what happens here? Well, here, you cannot have a function that is divided by 0. So in this function, we need to exclude 1 from the domain. So what is the domain of this function? It's going to be the real numbers except for the number one, because that's where this function at one is not going to be well defined. So how will our new function look like? Well, it's going to look like these two black black uh, lines, where except that it's not going to be defined at one, okay? They are going to have an asymptote at one. Um, another operation that we are going to use a lot in economics is the composition of functions. So the composition of functions is just like substituting a, one function into the other when you are thinking about algebra. So f, the composition between f and g, is just f evaluated at g of x. So let me show it to you with an example. So the composition between f and g is just we take the function f, and we plug g wherever we see an x. Okay, so this is gx squared plus 2 times gx. And this is just x squared plus 2, x, this is g, squared plus 2 times g of x. Sorry, ah, I made a mistake here. Our g is actually 9x minus 1. 9x minus 1 squared plus 2 9x minus 1. Okay? So what is this thing? 
this is 81a squared minus 18x plus 1, I'm just squaring the first part, plus 18x minus 2. So we can simplify a little bit because these two guys cancel each other. And what we obtain is 81x squared minus 1. Now, when do we use this thing? Well, many times we have a utility function, say log of x. We have a budget constraint that says that your x, which is your level of consumption, is, I don't know, two times your income. Um, and then what we want to do is to figure out, you know, what is your consumption as a function of income. Uh, and we replace one into another. This many times allows us to simplify a multidimensional problem back into a one variable problem. And this is going to become very handy when we do optimization. So at the end of this module, we are going to look at a few examples where we will have to use the composition of functions to simplify the problem and to make it easier to, to, you know, to solve. Now, one last thing I want to point out, notice that evaluating f at g of x is not the same than evaluating g at f of x. So if you evaluate g at f of x, what you obtain is 9x squared plus 18x minus 1, which is not the same that we obtained before. So you cannot, while you can interchange sums of functions and sub, uh, while you can inter interchange sum of functions, you cannot in interchange the order uh, of the composition of functions. So here you want to be a little bit careful when you do this. Now, the last thing uh, I want to talk about, because you are going to use a lot, and I'm going to go very briefly because I kind of assume that this is something that you know about, is how to solve a system of linear equations. You are going to use this a lot to find equilibrium prices, etc. Now, again, the part that I'm most interested in here is going from the word problem into the mathematical problem, because this is what I want you to practice. Then, you know, I'm assuming you kind of solve how to you know how to solve a system of equations and unknowns. So let's look at our motivation example. You would like to take your nephew to his weekend's game. One of your friends bought two other tickets and one child ticket for $8. Another friend mentioned earlier that one other ticket and three child tickets cost her $9. You're trying to figure out the price of each. So what is this? what are you trying to figure out? Two things, the price of another ticket and the price of a child ticket. So we are going to call the price of another ticket X and the price of a child ticket Y. So what is the information that we have? That two other tickets, so two times X and one child ticket, which is Y, is equal to $8. So basically, you know that if you add up the cost of two other tickets, and one child ticket, you spend it eight bucks. Another thing, another piece of information, this is not enough to figure out because you have two unknowns and one equation. To solve a system, you need enough equations as the number of unknowns, but you have the other information here. So one other ticket, X, and three child tickets, three Y, cost you nine bucks. So you know that one other ticket plus three child tickets is nine bucks. So how do you figure out the price of each? So here you are trying to figure out what X and Y are. You need to solve this system of equations. Again, this is one example. The typical example that you're going to have in economics is supply and demand functions. You're going to have supply, you're going to have a demand that depend on prices and quantities, and you will try to find the equilibrium prices and quantities. Um, how do you solve for, for an equation? Well, there are three ways you typically solve for an equation. Either you plot, especially if it's a linear equation, it's kind of easy. You plot the two equations and you find the values of, at which you, they intersect. Again, this is a typical supply and, 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 and demand example. And this is typically the equilibrium price. Here, we are talking about you know um, our specific case. So how do we do that in our example? So we have our two equations, which were, let me see if I have it written somewhere. So 2x plus y is equal to 8. So here we are plotting 
y as a function of x, so y is minus 2x plus 8. So it's an equation that has an, an intercept of 8 and a slope of minus 2, so it's going to be negatively slope. Our second equation is, uh, I think it was x plus 3y is equal to 9. Again, we need to solve for y as a function of x. So this is going to be, we can divide everything by 3 and move x to the other side. So it's going to be um, 9 minus x divided by 3 or 3 minus uh, 1 third x. This is going to be our other equation. So you can plot them and you can find where they intersect. Now, remember when you're plotting functions, if you're solving, if you're plotting a system of equations and the two functions are parallel, there's going to be no intersection. So there's going to be no solution to the problem. If you are uh, plugging two functions that ended up coinciding with each other, then there are infinite equations because they coincide at every point. Anything, it's a solution. Now, here it looks kind of silly in the linear example because you would never use this inefficient method, but sometimes you have more complicated functions and, you know, doing a graph may help, especially when you are debugging a computational pro problem, for example. Now, the, the most obvious way in, in which you would solve for the system of equation is through substitution. So you pick one equation, you solve y as a function of x, we did this before, and then you plug it or substitute this into the other equation. So remember, this, is, this was y in the other equation. And you solve for the first variable, x is equal to 3. Once you know x is equal to 3, you can co go back to our first equation and solve for the value of y, which is, is equal to 2. So the price of the tickets are 2 and 3, respectively. Finally, you can do elimination by addition you can read this here, you're almost never going to use this method, but you know, I, I just put it there for your information. Now with that, we are going to conclude the second submodule. What we are going to do next is we are going to talk about derivatives. Uh, we are going to connect them to slopes, and then we are going to relate this back to, you know, properties of functions, whether they are increasing or decreasing, and finally to optimization, but let's do that in the next video.